All right, let's go to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. Yes! We get excited about the Word of God. We have started a series on the book of Acts. How many of y'all were here for last week, part one? Come on, we were stirring it up last week, and this week we're going to pick up right where we left off. At the end of Acts chapter 1, Jesus had told his disciples, stay in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. Stay in the place where you've experienced your biggest heartache, your biggest disappointment. Jerusalem represented a place where these disciples wanted to leave. They were angry at Jerusalem. None of these guys were, were uh, Jerusalem was not their hometown, Galilee. Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. And yet Jesus said, I want you to stay right where, we, right where you saw me crucified, right where you turned your backs on me, not just where you felt disappointment, but where you felt shame because of your own mistakes. I don't want you to run from the place where you experienced pain. I want you to stay there because where the enemy struck you the hardest, the Holy Spirit is about to strike back. Where you've experienced your biggest pain, you're going to experience your greatest healing, and not just for you, but for Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was saying there's going to be a powerful manifestation of God's presence right in the same place where you experience hurt and pain. That's a prophetic word for someone in the room today, that God wants you to lean in and pray where you felt hurt and pain. You watched as Ashley walked up on this stage today on Mother's Day weekend, the weekend she was not looking forward to after losing her mother um, last year, and you watched as she just began to pour it out, and I just felt the power of God flowing through Ashley. See, what the enemy has used to try to mess with you is gonna turn into your message. Where you've been tested, it's gonna be a testimony. We all walk through pain, we all walk through loss, but we either get bitter or we get better. And if you get bitter, you run from your testimony. You get angry, you become resentful, and you think you're winning with that, but you never win with revenge. You never win with resentment. You never win by avoiding the place of pain. You win when you lean into it and say, Satan, you came after me, but I'm coming back after you, and I'm getting my joy back, I'm getting my family back, I'm getting my peace back, I'm getting my power back. This is what Jesus was telling his disciples to do. He was saying, stay in this city of religiosity. Stay in this place where people have been turned because of the Pharisees, and I want you to pour out your hearts in prayer. Go to that upper room. Now, Jesus appeared to 500 people. In the book of Acts chapter 1, 500 people had seen Jesus, experienced Jesus after his resurrection. It wasn't just 12 disciples. It was 500 eyewitness accounts who had seen Jesus, but only 120 gathered to pray. Out of 500 people, only 120 up in that upper room met with those 12 disciples. Those 12 were part of that 120. Isn't it interesting that only 24% of the church showed up when Jesus invited all 500 of them to be a part of preparing for Pentecost? But yet there was a remnant. There was a core. The core always wants more. I'm looking at a core this morning that's leaning in for more. And that 24%, they said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray through our pain. We're going to pray through our tears. We're going to pray through our disappointment. We're going to pray through our hurts. We're going to pray through our wounds. We're going to pray through our grief and our loss. I'm telling you, there's something powerful about prayer. Prayer connects heaven down to earth. When we begin to pray, and I'm telling you, these guys had not yet experienced a new language, but they were praying in their known tongue. If you don't know how to pray in the spirit, at least pray with some words by saying, Lord, I need you. God, I'm asking for you. Lord, I want more of your spirit. You say, well, what, what good does that do for me? Prayer fills you with his power. I want to title this message today, Get Your Power Back. Tell someone next to you, Get Your Power Back. How many of you guys um, on Wednesday night, you could feel the storms rolling through Oklahoma? You, could, you, you, were, you had Travis Myers on. You were watching Channel 6 or maybe Mike Collier on Channel 2. You were tuned in. How many of y'all were watching it, right? Me and Ashley, we were watching it. We were, we were preparing, and we had just got done laying down the kids. The kids were excited. They were like, is there a tornado? Is something going to happen? We said, just calm down. Just go to sleep. And right around 9.45, I said, Ashley, I got to go get gas. She was like, why do you need gas? I said, well, I'm on empty, and I got to get gas to take the kids to school in the morning. But really... I've always had a dream to be a meteorologist. 
like on the side, like just like the Travis Myers inside of me has always wanted to just see what's going on out there in the storms. And so I, I drove to Quick Trip, and, um, and I was standing outside of Quick Trip. Thank you, Jesus, for Quick Trip. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was standing outside, and the storms were rolling in. The lightning was striking, and people were talking inside Quick Trip. They said, did you hear about the power outages? There's power outages all over this way, and it's headed towards Oak Mulgee, and there's a tornado coming through. And so I got in my car, start driving towards Oak Mulgee, and I got, the, I got praise and worship music on, and I'm, I'm ready. And so I'm praying in the spirit, and I'm watching the lightning storm going, and Ashley's like, get home now. you know. But, but here's the point. As the power outages started happening in certain places, this is, what the, this is what the Lord began to speak to me, that the enemy has come after people's power. And it was hitting not just businesses, it was hitting homes. The enemy has tried to strike power out in homes and families. Some of you have experienced power outages in your own life where you've lost your joy, you've lost your peace, you've lost your sense of direction. When the power went out at certain intersections, I noticed this, I pulled up to certain intersections and the lights were just going off like crazy. Or some, the lights were totally out. And cars didn't know whether to stop or to go. This is what the enemy does. When he tries to come after your power, he creates a confusion. And you don't know, do I stay or do I go? Do I go, do I go, stay? And crashes start happening because they're not being directed at what time see when you're in tune with the holy spirit you have direction of when to go you have direction on where to go you have direction on when to turn you have direction on uh, what's in front of you when the power goes out the lights go out it's dark in the in the in that place but this is where the disciples were at they were in jerusalem and they were praying almost in the dark they were praying in an unknown moment they didn't know when the holy spirit was going to come they didn't have Bibles back then. They didn't have uh, what we have. You and I, we know the story. We go, yeah, it fell on Pentecost. Pentecost hadn't happened yet. All they knew was to keep showing up and praying, praying. Before you make another decision, before you move through that intersection where you're not sure, bathe it in prayer. We're in a time right now where we need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. We need to be praying like never before. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. I'm going to say that again. Prayer should be our first response to things, not our last resort. So when you are faced with a decision, how many of you guys got decisions you got to make? How many of you guys are feeling the pressure in some way to make decisions? You're like, I didn't have to make a decision, but all of a sudden I got pressure to now because other people, you know. And when that pressure starts coming, the question is, did you pray about it? Well, no, but I've talked to people about it. You've talked to people about it. Have you talked to God about it? Well, yeah, I mean, I threw up a prayer on the, way to, on the way to church this morning. But see, God wants us to bathe it in prayer. These disciples were bathing every decision in prayer. They would shut the door. Some of us have left the door open, so we're distracted during our prayer time. We've got our phones out. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're checking in with society. We're checking in to see what is, what's the government saying? What's President Biden saying? What's Governor uh, Stitt saying? What's, what are these people going to do? You know, when our church started making decisions during the pandemic, we stopped consulting with everybody else's opinions, and we shut the door, and we said, we're going to do what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. I would rather disappoint man and please God then please man and disappoint God. Well, Facebook's happy with me. And God's going, you didn't even ask for my opinion on that. God's not pleased just because Facebook's happy with you. Just because other people, are, see, we've got to come back to these disciples. They were in that upper room and they were saying, Lord, if you're not in it, we don't want it. God, if you're not speaking it, we don't want to do it. If you're not leading us, if it's not God, who chooses the directions of your life? People or God? pressure or God, the paranoia of people or the prince of peace. These disciples, they were gathered in that upper room and they were getting power just through prayer. Prayer produces power. Just say that with me. Prayer produces power. How has the enemy come for your power? For some of you, it's been fear. The fear of man or the fear of the lack of provision. Paul, if I do this, what if I run out? What if people don't like it? What if, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Fear has struck so many people in this season. The fear of being canceled by society. The fear of not measuring up. The fear of, man, what if I don't have what it takes? For some, where the enemy has come after your power, it's been offense. 
John Bevere calls offense the bait of Satan. The bait of Satan. I was talking with my boys the other day about fishing. And they said, Daddy, what, we need some good bait. We need some bait where the fish go, ah, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Where the fish are hungry for it. Because the bait we've been using hasn't been working when we've gone fishing. They said, we need to find some good bait, some bait that is delicious to these fish. Can I tell you, the enemy knows what's delicious to church people. When the church is not fighting darkness, listen to me right here. When the church is not fighting darkness, the church starts fighting each other. This is why Jesus said, be in one accord. Lord, I pray that my disciples, Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. You can't be one with your brothers when you're fighting with your brothers, when you're fighting with your sisters. And a house divided cannot stand. See, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't just multi-generational. It wasn't just multi-ethnic. It wasn't just for fathers and daughters and sons and mothers. It was about a unified church carrying revival that was going to turn cities upside down because they had unusual camaraderie. They had unusual unity. They were sharing what they had. They were working together. They were forgiving their brothers and sisters. They were taking care of widows and orphans. They had cleansed their heart of all offense. Don't take the bait of Satan. The enemy comes for your power with fear, with offense. For some of you, he comes with anger, confusion, comparison. I wish I had what they had. I wish I could do what they were doing. Pride, selfishness, sin, shame, the shame of missing it. Did you know that God was about to use a man who was full of so much shame to preach the greatest sermon for the early church? That this man, Peter who had been canceled by so many people, disqualified by so many people. Peter had a foul mouth. Peter, <laughs> Peter was cutting dude's ears off. Don't try to polish Peter. Peter was, he, he had issues just like us. How many of y'all got issues? And those of you that didn't raise your hands, you can come to the altar at the end because your family's like, she has issues. She didn't raise her hand, but trust me, I've seen her. When, no, when y'all haven't seen her, she's got issues. Don't tell her on Mother's Day, but we all know we all, how many of y'all know we all got issues, right? And there's good news because God uses people with issues. When the world had canceled Peter, Jesus said, I've prayed for you, Peter. Satan came for you. He tried to use all your insecurities, all your weaknesses, all your shortcomings. But I'm praying that you're going to be restored and that you're going to preach your best sermon yet. You're going to write your greatest message yet. And the world's going to be changed through broken people like these ordinary men who followed Jesus. Not because they had great degrees. Not because they came from wealthy families. Not because they were all cleaned up and perfect and never missed it. But because they had been with Jesus and because they had been with Jesus they prayed in that upper room and in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 when the day of Pentecost came they were all together in one place I'm looking at a room of people that are all together in one place don't underestimate the power of showing up together in one place can I tell you not everyone who started with these guys finished with these guys you go through seasons where the, where the Lord thins out. Not everyone who starts with you finishes with you. And so these guys had looked around and they're looking and they're going, where's Zacchaeus at? Where's Nicodemus? Where's blind Bartimaeus? Where's Judas at? And they had to make a decision. It doesn't matter who's not here. What matters is who is here. And we're going to stand together and we're going to be in one accord and we're going to gather where two or three gather. All I need is two or three to gather. All I need is just a couple of people who come in agreement and prayer to say, Lord, I want to see revival in my family. I want to see restoration in our cities. I want to be a repair of broken down walls. God, I want the prophecy of Isaiah 58. I want our church to be known for turning cities and towns and countries upside down. God's getting ready to shift things in America. Can you feel it? There's about to be a suddenly. There's about to be a Pentecost day. There's about to be an outpouring. Verse 2, suddenly, as these men and women were praying together, young and old, black and white, Asian and Hispanic, suddenly there was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind come from heaven, filling the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began 
begin to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enabled them. Now you might be going, Paul, what language is that? What are you talking about? When I was really little, I remember my parents praying for me. I remember being baptized here and in the church. And when I came out of the water, my dad said, God wants to give you a language. The Holy Spirit is not reserved to 18 years old and up. There is not a junior varsity Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that speaks to parents wants to speak to children. The same gifts of the Spirit that flow in Oral Roberts want to flow through you. It's not just reserved for the 12 apostles. There's, there, there was not a stop to the gifts of the Spirit in the book of Acts. It still wants to continue through the church today and I remember as a kid I, I received this this language and I didn't know how to say it at first and it didn't come all these words didn't start coming at first you see receiving the language of heaven and it is a language of heaven and when you don't know what to pray you can begin to pray in the spirit and you say Paul it's gibberish it doesn't mean anything none of us know what you're doing but you're building yourself up Jude says I pray in the spirit to build myself up to connect myself with heaven's will when I don't know what to pray about a situation I begin to pray in the spirit and the Lord begins to give me the wisdom and the understanding and I'm praying the will of God when I pray in the Holy Spirit and then God begins to give an interpretation for that tongue now, I don't get up on this stage for 30 minutes and just speak in tongues because we wouldn't really know what, what's being said. And that's not what happened here. They began praying in tongues, and then God gave Peter a sermon from that moment. God gave Peter a message. People in the city started hearing their, their, their own language in Jerusalem. There's always someone watching when you start moving in power because there's other people. They don't have the same power as you. They're threatened by the energy. They see a fresh wind. They see a fresh fire. They say, I need what he's got. I'll have what she has. I'll do, you know what I'm saying? They could hear a change in the city. There's about to be a change in the city of Tulsa. There's about to be a shift. There's about to be a suddenly. And in Jerusalem, verse 5, it says, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, when they heard this Sound, and I circled those two words, this sound. God wants to give a fresh sound to his church. We've heard some beautiful sounds over the years, but let's not keep regurgitating the sounds of the past. God wants to give a fresh sound, a new sound for 2022. And when people hear this sound, it says they gathered in bewilderment. Suddenly people who were all separated became unified because they saw another group of people that were unified with a fresh sound. God's about to connect all these people who are in bewilderment, and they begin to ask one another, do you hear what they're saying? Are you hearing that? That's our language. Aren't all of these people who are speaking these languages Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in our native tongue? And they begin to describe that they could hear their language in, in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, the Cretans, the Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and confused. They said, what does this mean? These people must be drunk. And Peter stands up. When you begin to pray in the spirit, it is a power supply. It's a power supply to speak the word of God. It's a power supply to know what to say and to who to say it to and when to say it at the right time. Peter begins to stand up. He says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. This is not drunkenness. It's only nine in the morning. It's too early for us to be drunk, he says. I love Peter's candidness. <laughs> He says, this was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, all people. Everybody say everybody. Even your enemies. Even the people you've canceled. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Your sons and your daughters. This is a prophecy over every family in the room who's got a son or a daughter that's away, that's prodigal, that's not here yet. God says, I'm coming after them. I'm going to pour out my spirit on them. I'm coming after with love. I'm coming after with peace. I'm coming after them with prophetic words. Call them back home. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Church, God has a multi-generational revival coming. We need each other, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. So we just started this Wednesday noon prayer meeting this last week, and I just invited last Sunday, I said, anyone who wants to come pray this Wednesday, we're going to pray at noon in this room. We just pushed play on the CD player up there or whatever it's, you know, the iPad. What, what? 
the computer, you know, the music. It's flowing through the sound system. We didn't have a band. There was no sermon. We just pushed play. And we started praying, and hundreds of people showed up to pray. And within the first 15 minutes, this guy walks up to me, and he just kind of looks confused, and he's like, what's going on here? I said, we're praying. He said, I was just driving by here, and I just, I needed help. I walked in, and I saw music, heard music playing, came in here. And he said, something, something feels different. This was just three days ago on Wednesday. And I said, what can I do for you? You want to join us and pray? He said, I want to get saved. He said, I need Jesus. There hadn't been a sermon. He was listening to people talking in tongues. And you go, well, tongues is going to scare away these people. No, they need something that the world has not been able to deliver. See, they've, they've seen all the spirits in the world. They felt all the spirits in the world. In fact, most of the world that's not in church, the highest grossing genre of movies is horror movies, specifically in the demonic supernatural realm. Like Paranormal Activity was one of the highest grossing movies because people are interested in the supernatural. They understand the exorcist. They understand that there's something supernatural out there in the world. So when they see something supernatural that's not demonic, that's heavenly, something that's actually filling people with peace and joy and grace and stability and perseverance, you see, when you get the Holy Spirit, he produces power, not for you to be a show-off, but for you to have patience, love, joy, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I don't know how I got through it, but the Holy Spirit began to produce in me the fruits of the Spirit. And then when I was walking in the Spirit, I'm not gratifying the desires of the flesh. And when I'm in the flesh, but I call on the spirit he pulls me back on the road that I need to be on see the Holy Spirit he connects you back to your purpose and this guy said I want Jesus said let's pray right now he got saved right there and joined our prayer meeting on Wednesday we're gonna keep on praying on Wednesdays at noon if you want to come in and I'm telling you there's an endless supply of power Peter says in the last days we are in the last days I was reading my dad's book this last month heaven is on its feet my mom and dad wrote it 20 years ago. And in, in that book, it talks about how heaven is cheering us on, that we are in these last days. Let us throw off every weight that's holding us back. Let us throw off every entanglement. Let us run the race. Heaven is on its feet. I was playing video games the other day with my kids, and, and um, there's, this, there's two buttons you can push that take you into turbo power. Control shift. And I remembered this as a kid. When I was a kid, we had Super Nintendo, NBA Jam, Tournament Edition. Y'all remember that? Anybody grow up on Super Nintendo? And Donkey Kong. And, uh, you know, there was, back in the day, PlayStation 1, Blitz, 96. And so there was these two buttons you'd push, Control, Shift, Control, Shift. And if you push Control first and Shift and you held it down, you could tap into Turbo Power. And you would run faster. You could dunk the ball over people. You could have like invisible features. There was all kinds of stuff, but it was through control shift. And here's what the Holy Spirit's saying. The church needs a control shift. We need to stop trying to control our lives and shift the control back to the Holy Spirit. We need to stop trying to control our services, stop trying to control our ministries, stop trying to control, stop trying to shift the control to the government or shift the control to the opinions of man and bring a shift control back to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, we want your way. We want your will. We want your power. I want you to stand your feet all over this room. Y'all, it's time for a control shift in your life. Some of you have walked through a power outage. You've walked through a, a hit towards your home, a hit towards your marriage, a hit towards your son, a hit towards your daughter. And we're not here to describe what that hit was because that's really not the point. The point is it's time to get your power back. Well, we need to dissect what it was. No, I just need my power turned back on. Well, hold on, let's go look at the light pole and see what knocked out the line. No, let's get our power back. And let's get our power back with a sustainable source. Because there's a little bit of power that might come from inspiration, motivation, little things. I was praying this last week and I felt like so many people are living off of unsustainable power shots. So we're, we're taking our espresso beans. We got a little bit of energy. We're taking our protein shakes, a little bit of energy. We're watching our Instagram sermon clips, one minute long, a little bit of, little bit of spiritual you can't become spiritually mature through TikTok and Instagram. You got to get in your Bible. You got to get in the spirit. You got to get in the upper room. 
God says, I have fresh wind for you. I have fresh ideas for you. I have fresh manna for you. I have, and you don't have to carry that heavy burden. You saw me last week carrying this pulpit. God wants to lift off. Some of us have lost our power because we're carrying loads we weren't meant to carry. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here right now, you just need to get your power back. You need to get your strength back. You need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Just raise your hand all over this room. God's talking to you, to your family, to you, to that situation you're facing, to whatever it is. You just need direction. You need energy. You need strength. You need clarity. You need purpose. You need spirit-led movements, spirit-led decisions right now. If you raised your hand or you wanted to, our band's just going to lead us in this song. I want you to leave your seat and just come and join me at this altar. I'm right here with you. I'm saying, Lord, I want more of your spirit. Lord, I need more of your Holy Spirit in my life. Lord, I want to I tap into the power that comes from heaven. I need strength, not just for Monday, but for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Thursday. God, I need power to be the husband you've called me to be, to be the daddy you've called me to be for Liam, for Benaiah, for Matt, for Ellie, for Gianna. Lord, I want fresh words from heaven. God, I want fresh songs from heaven. Lord, I want a new sound, a sound for 2020. God says, I want to give you more of my spirit. He says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Peter began to preach and people begin to be convicted in their hearts to say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you. I'm putting my faith in you. I'm putting my hope in you. Just begin to lead us in that song, Lamar. And let's just begin to ask for more of the Holy Spirit, more of God. This altar is open for anyone who needs more of Jesus, more of His Spirit. If you want the gifts of the Spirit, come and join us at this altar. If you want this, the, the, the gifts to be evident in your life, come down to this altar to say, Lord, I want to stir it up. God, I want to begin to pray on another level. I want to begin to spend time with you on another level. Lord, I want to know your voice. felt like the Lord said, there are young believers in the room that need to connect with older believers in the room. There's sons that need to have fathers and restored relationship with their mothers and their fathers. And I felt like the Lord said, it's for both generations. There's mothers and fathers that there's been such a power hit to your heart because of 
strained relationships, God says, it's time to connect again with your sons and daughters, your grandsons and your granddaughters. God says there's going to be a multi-generational outpouring. And he's saying it's time to let go of whatever wounds you've been holding on to, hurts. It's time to choose to step towards forgiveness. Take a step of humility. And if you can't connect biologically with a son or daughter, that you would take on a spiritual mother or father, spiritual uh, son or daughter. God says it's time to begin to pray for generations together. To pray that God would give energy, strength, wisdom. That there's a, there is a spiritual exchange in heaven that wants to happen between fathers and mothers and sons and daughters. Grandmothers and grandfathers. Don't miss it. There's a window of opportunity. Holy Spirit, God, I pray in Jesus' name, this week would be a week, God, that there would be a connection between generations, God, outside of church, this week, that there would even just in their workplace, God, that you would connect the young and the old to pray into each other, to speak into each other, to encourage each other. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, you would connect the dots for people, even as they're going into uh, just places to, to go get groceries or to get gas or wherever they're going, God, that you would show them people they're to encourage this week, people they're called to witness to and speak to. Just yesterday, I was, I was walking into a gas station, and this man said, um, he said, you know, I was watching TV the other night, and I saw your face. And he said, I haven't been to church in a long time, but I decided to just keep watching because we're on Channel 8 at like 1 a.m. in the morning. And I always felt in my heart we were supposed to be on at midnight, that there's a midnight hour. There's people that are just hurting people that are, you know, either getting off work or they're working through the night in hospitals, nursing homes, security guards, and um, gas station clerks. And, and he said, I left it on there. And he said, I've been going through a lot. And he said, um, seeing you now in person in the flesh, he said, this is, this is a reminder. I've got to get back to church. He said, my mom has been praying. I need to get back to church. And I felt in my spirit this week that prodigal sons, some of you have been praying for sons, nephews, nieces, prodigal daughters. Some of you have been praying for prodigal dads, prodigal moms that just haven't gotten in church. Either they got hurt or church hurt or something that just caused them to separate. But I'm telling you, God is sending prophetic reminders in the middle of the night to pull them back into their purpose, to pull them back into community, to pull them back into a place of grace, a place of healing. So Lord, I pray right now, God, this week would be a week of divine appointments as each person goes out. Lord, today, that you would connect them to people that you want to encourage, to invite, to witness, to pray for. And God, I pray for fresh power. If you're here right now and you just say, I need to get right with God. I need to repent and receive him in my heart fully devoted. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you, raise your hand today. You're saying, I want to get saved. I want to get right with God. I want to repent. I want to give my heart to Jesus. All right, let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I want your Holy Spirit in my life. I repent of every sin and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead and I confess you as my Savior, my Lord. I'm all yours and I receive your power. And this week, I'm going to stir it up in my prayer time. I'm going to focus on you and I'm going to receive your power for each day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great rest of your week.